Welcome to the Age to Come webcast. This is Biblical Doctrine for the Church in this Age. I'm Dave Wilson here as always with uh, Josh Howard and Pernell Gibson. And today we are on episode 18 already. Uh, and today we're talking about eschatology, so that's going to be fun, and uh, we'll the see if we can get through it without uh, fighting or uh, I'll punching make each it other. Or... Episodes without getting into eschatology, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess we've maybe touched on it a little bit here and there, but right. uh, yeah. this is one of those episodes and one of those topics, kind of like us talking about uh, soteriology or, or salvation, where there's a lot of elements that are really kind of bled together. So it's something that we might do an episode on it, and we're going to cover aspects of it, but there will certainly be more to come. There's no way we're obviously going to cover. Uh, you know, even a fraction of what uh, what right. is eschatology. But I, I guess on that note, so um, you might not even be familiar with that word. So what is eschatology? Can we, one of you guys want to break down kind of just a simple uh, definition or... A study of the last things. There you go. <laughs> that was the one I was going to use. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, last yeah things, study of the last final things. things. Judgment. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's such... kind of as opposed to creation, so we could look at, you know, studying right. creation. Okay, mm. that's the beginning. Yeah. Um, eschatology is the last things what does the final state look mm -hmm. like what does the future look like if you, yeah. if you have like an uh you know typically if you have like a a, a systematic theology text textbook where each different category is discussed that type of thing you know the, all the doctrines of the faith laid out eschatology is going to be almost always like that final chapter or those final two chapters maybe mm -hmm. uh, of those books which is how most people think of it is it, it's at the very end of the story i'd mm -hmm. push back and say no it's the whole movement of the story toward that end mm -hmm. but um but a lot of times it's just those things at the final end um there is an eschatological i said it without spitting um there was an eschatological <laughs> <better> uh, than me. <laughs> <laughs> um story on the news this week um where a few red heifers were flown to israel mm, I saw and that. social media lit up like a firestorm so some of you out there are saying yes you know i was i was on that bandwagon and then others are just saying what's a red heifer and why does that matter well that would be eschatology yeah, yeah among other things. Yeah. And speaking of that, uh, you know, kind of coming at the end, same thing in the Bible. You know, when we think of eschatology, a lot of times we think of the book of Revelation. Right. You know, dealing with those last things. So uh, likewise, that's the final uh, book in the the canon of our of our scripture. So um, so I guess if we could just kind of break it down. So what is, so there's obviously, there's a lot of different views. This is mm -hmm. maybe the most controversial of any uh, sort of, thing within Christendom in terms of, uh, you know, just there being different views and, um, people I, get I, mad, people get mad, <laughs> people get real mad Goodness. about this, uh, about having different, uh, different eschatologies, but let's, let's kind of look at, okay, so what are some things that are within the bounds of orthodoxy? And then what are things outside of that? And by that, what I mean is, um, you know, there's, we don't necessarily have to agree on everything to have unity and faith. Mm -hmm. You know, we can have, you know, if you uh, have looked at our church website, we don't, really take a firm stand on a lot of the particulars of eschatology just because those aren't gospel essentials mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that like the person of Christ, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, the things like that. Mm -hmm. So um, so there's room for some disagreement about certain things or, or different views, but what would you guys consider? How, how do we sort of define what is within orthodoxy and then what is outside where we'd say, no, that's not only is that wrong, that's actually a false teaching or um, something like that. Right. Well, I would say that uh, one thing that we all should agree on is that there's going to be a, a consummation that Jesus is going to come back. Yeah. You know, um, I'm trying to think. And bodily. Yeah, bodily. Bodily yeah, as well. Be, yeah, definitely. Um, and we would make something. that a point. No, well, I was going to add, we would make that a point of orthodoxy because Scripture does. Right. So, so right. you know, Paul in, in several places says that that is, that is a core teaching or, or a teaching of first order of the Christian faith is mm -hmm. that Christ will return again. Um, bodily to judge the living and the dead. So we could add judgment in there too. Yep. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we were going to get there. Yep. But that's something that scripture says is is, is non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. So to have an Orthodox Christian eschatology, you must have a Christ returning at the end in bodily form. Right. Mm -hmm. Plus, I just mentioned judgment. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Christ comes not only in glory, but he comes in glory to judge the living and the dead. Right. Yeah. That would be part of it. Yep. Yeah. So, so one thing then that that would rule out, if that's within the bounds of orthodoxy, by default, that sort of makes what we would call a um, like a hyper or full preterism uh, outside of that. Uh, right. um, so, so preterism, I, I believe that there's elements of preterism that are true in that a lot of what are sometimes looked at as the end times uh, Bible passages or texts, a lot of those were fulfilled um, within the lifetime of the sure. apostles in AD yeah. 70. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we could do a whole episode on AD 70 oh, yeah. and on, on the events uh, thereof. But um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that'll that be a good one. Um, but uh, but so there, there's uh, 
Preterism just basically refers to past as opposed to future futurism, which would be future. And, mm-hmm. and in general, um, there's orthodox uh, partial preterists, which are going to say that some of the events of, right. you know, Revelation or some of these sort of end times events were fulfilled in, in AD 70, but then there's still some left to come. But there is a view that's called uh, hyper preterism or full preterism that actually sees um, basically everything being fulfilled in AD 70, right. um, including and, Christ's return, including yeah. Christ's yeah. bodily return yeah. and yeah. final judgment and all that. So that would be the thing that then gets ruled out if we say, well, no, it is an essential of the Christian faith that Christ will return turn physically in judgment in the future right That's yeah good. what particular views hold that last one that that it's already occurred like um, does it even fall under well, a particular camp? views so, yeah so, so when you're talking about different views you're 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 talking about the camp of of a uh, orthodox christian eschatology so yeah. we're talking about non-orthodox views. i see they're not going to get yeah. into one of those into, okay orthodox i see what you're camps. saying right gotcha. so i'm not aware gotcha. of any particular like denomination yeah. or any type of specific creeds or things like that okay. it's more just like it's kind of a fringe position like gotcha. it's i've ran into a handful of, of full preterists here and there um that's not a common view by any means gotcha um but it is a view that's out there unfortunately sure. so it's, it's just something to be aware of right good um okay so so yeah and it seems like you know looking at those things in terms of okay i i would agree that's probably the biggest essential is just okay christ is coming back physically Mm -hmm. there is the future judgment uh of the living and the dead and uh when you look at vindication of the saints we could add in yes Mm -hmm. that would be part of that as well judgment of the judgment of the reprobate vindication of the saint Okay. Right. Right. And those things are in line with really the historic creeds and confessions of the Christian faith. You know, mm-hmm. you look at the Apostles Creed, the Nicene Creed, the you know, Chalcedonian Creed, you know, all these these different things. They tend to not say a whole lot about eschatology, but there's pretty much always a sentence or two uh that talks about that. Mm-hmm. Right. Um Okay, um, so what are uh what are then some of the major views within? So we're talking that's without orthodoxy but then Mm -hmm. when we look at within orthodoxy what are sort of some of the different um eschatological models or views um that we will that we will encounter there goodness well i mean if you want to because you have the uh you have the amillennial view Mm -hmm. you have post-millennial pre-millennial dispensationalist and historic pre-millennial Explaining all of those, I think, is going to say we assume difficult. you guys understand yeah. each of those terms fully. Really. No, <laughs> I, I want to. I, I will say, um, out of all of those, just from my own studies, and I'm by no means an expert. Like it, it seems to me that the amillennial view is is the most consistent with what Scripture teaches, um, just in terms of being focused on Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, it, like for the for the post mill view, as as sympathetic as I am to the, is a very. You're gonna want to define those a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so, so what I was gonna say, the, the post millennial uh, view, the best way that I can explain it, and feel free to jump in um, if this is not sufficient. But the belief is that the the church, the church will make <laughs> make basically defeat evil and prepare it for the return of Christ. That's one of the things that, uh, like I said, I'm sympathetic to that because I like the idea of good defeating evil and and so on and so forth. I just, I don't, I don't see that. Do you have a better definition for the post mill view? Yeah, a better so, way to explain it? so I think kind of one thing that I think we ought to break down even before we talk about some of that stuff is mm. just the idea of so you you said the word mill a lot, yeah, like mill or millennial, and mm. that's that's how a lot of these. Um, sort of views of end times get defined as we talk about post-millennial, amillennial, yep. pre-millennial, um, and that's really only one aspect of um, of eschatology, and that is uh, the subject of the millennium. So mm-hmm. if you've read like the Book of Revelation, it talks about there being you know this uh, this thousand year reign of Christ, mm-hmm. um, and that's I, I think it's kind of unfortunate that that seems to be the thing that people focus in on because like when you look at eschatology, like that's just one small piece of the puzzle. Right. Um, you know the the idea of the millennium millennial reign but um most people who have never heard these terms yeah (laughs) right no yeah i mean i I had a guy i remember one time in church um and he was he was talking about he said he said you know i know what the bible teaches which is um pre-tribulational but he said i ran into a guy one time we were talking blah 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 and then that came out he was mid-tribulational can you believe such people exist out there in the christian world and i was like so that's like a narrow part you know pre mid or post tribulational is a narrow part or a narrow definition within 
dispensational premillennialism, which, which is, is already a narrow, a narrow definition. Yep. Um, the, the, the views that typically when people think of, of end times views, um, uh, kind of like you were talking about Purnell, you'll go to, uh, the two premillennial views and then amillennial and postmillennial, mm-hmm. which are really killiastic, killiastic views. So, um, there's, there's a study, so you see you smiling. Never there's a study that. called killiasm, <laughs> Early um, church, and yeah. that's taken from the Greek word for thousand, which is kilia. Okay. Um, so kilia ete is actually the words there in revelation that's describing those thousand years. Those views are views on the millennial reign. Mm-hmm. They're not actually eschatological views. They're within eschatology, but they're not describing an overarching right. eschatology. They're describing really kiliastic views. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so talking about that, talking about this millennium, so that is, everyone agrees that the Bible, you know, specifically in Revelation, talks about uh, this millennial reign of Christ, but sort of where we disagree and where these different camps are named on is, first of all, when is the millennium? And then second of all, what is the substance of that millennium? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so sort of on, on one end of the spectrum, you have um, premillennialism, which is the view that most people have, mm-hmm. which is that uh, there's going to be um, a future reign of Christ that starts at Christ's return. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there is uh, the post and the amillennial view, which would say that, no, the thousand years is before Christ's return. Right. Yeah. So so that's kind of one way to break that down is when exactly is that millennium? Mm-hmm. Um, and typically, posts and amills will say that really the millennium is really more of a, it's not a literal thousand years, it's a figurative time um, that looks at, you know, the time between Christ's first and second coming. That's going to sure. be the position that we're going to, that we're going to, I think, all three of us take, Mm -hmm. um, that it's not referring to a specific future time. Uh, But then the other thing is just what is the substance of that millennium? And that's kind of going to be where Post and Amil will disagree. And that was kind of what Purnell was saying a minute ago. So post-millennials are going to be just much more optimistic in terms of just seeing the church being really victorious throughout that uh, throughout that time period. Uh, Whereas Amil's aren't necessarily... Uh, pessimistic, but generally they tend to be more like so. Th- there's a there's a victory <clears throat> in, in in both views. It's just I think the the post millennial view is a more traditional type of victory. The way yeah. that I think of mm-hmm. you know good overcoming and defeating evil. Yeah, um, and it's the world being Christianized it, it by and large. Definitely. Yeah. 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 I was trying I was trying to find I, I'm blanking on the fourth term, but typically when you look further out at broad eschatological views. Um, this is assuming that that you even believe the Bible, because there there are some eschatological views that really don't hold to Scripture, or, or you know don't claim to in the first place that that it's that it's God's word. But um, you could look at views. Um, sometimes they're called there. There's one called idealism. Mm-hmm. Um, there's one called historicism, where you try to track eschatology along the Christian church. Um, I'm blanking on the other two right now, but uh, but these are futurism approaches. and preterism. Futurism and preterism. Thank you, yeah. brother. Um, so um, those are ways though of of reading. It's really more of a hermeneutic from that perspective. Mm-hmm. I'm, we're, we're using really bad. We're I'm using, using bad words. No, to, we're uh, right to there describe. with you. It is a way of reading scripture. Is what it's describing. That's just what hermeneutics mm-hmm. essentially was aiming toward. Mm-hmm. Um, it's 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 a way of reading scripture. So when you read scripture and you flip open your Bible and you you read um, these these things speaking about the last days, do you read that as something that you expect to have been already fulfilled? Do you read that as describing different church ages? Do you realize? Do you read that as describing a spiritual reality? That's that's the way of reading the text, and we could say that's kind of your overall eschatology. Um, a lot of people. Um, I, I would say the vast majority of scriptures don't fall neatly into one of those camps. It's more of an eclectic approach, right? Mm-hmm. Some things l- seem a little more realist. Some things seem a little more idealist, that type of thing. But uh, but those would be the over- our, overarching eschatological categories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And those would be, frankly, less, probably less talked about uh, things, but certainly I think a better way to package it than talking about ah mill, pre mill, post mill, right. mm-hmm. things like that. Like, I think that's a, a more true sense of things. And uh, yeah, that actually kind of covers or relates to the next bullet point that I had is, which is just that really at the end of the day, your hermeneutics are going to determine your eschatology. Absolutely. Um, so I think it wasn't last episode. It was two episodes ago. We had one on hermeneutics or just another word for Bible interpretation. Mm-hmm. So how do we interpret the Bible? Mm-hmm. And uh, really that's going to be the thing that drives how we, how we look at the end times. Right. Um, and I kind of want, I want to lob something out there and I just want to see if you guys agree, disagree, whatever. But I would say that, so uh, if you haven't seen that episode, go back and watch that episode on hermeneutics, hermeneutics. Uh, on Bible interpretation. But we talked about just different methods of interpreting the Bible, and really the two that we are going to generally hold to the tightest, and I think this is generally going to be true of most 
um, just solid Christians, even outside sort of our theological camp. But the, the two that people are going to kind of hang on to the tightest are the um, um, grammatical historical method of interpretation, mm -hmm. um, which is basically just, okay, let's look at the context. What do the words mean? What do the words mean to the original audience? That sort right. of thing. It's a very uh, quite literal, not necessarily extremely woodenly literal, but, right. but a literal way of understanding things. So mm -hmm. that's going to be one hermeneutic that we're going to hold up. And then the other one that we're going to hold up in very high regard is the analogy of faith or letting scripture interpret scripture. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, it's going to be a little bit looser than this grammatical historical, but mm -hmm. it's going to be more okay, well, this was written in, you know, Hosea, and then here is how, you know, this New Testament author used it, or this was how he he sort of applied it. So we're both going to have these two, but I think, and this is what I want you guys to kind of comment on, I think that whichever one of those we give priority is going to be really the determiner of if we end up more like a dispensationalist, like a John MacArthur type, or more of a uh, amillennialist, like sure. we're going to kind of end up. So I think if you do take uh, the grammatical, literal, historical, I think you are going to end up with something close to like what John MacArthur has, something like a premillennial, maybe dispensational-ish yeah. uh, type thing, just because he's going to go back to, you know, all these passages in the Old Testament talking about God saying, okay, I'm going to give you this land with these boundaries, and since that has not been fulfilled, that therefore must then be future. Yeah. Um, whereas on the flip side, in the analogy of faith, you're going to say, well, yeah, it does seem that you know, maybe some of these promises were that way, but then here is how they get interpreted by the New Testament authors. Sure. So we're going to, you know, this hermeneutic sort of trumps this other one. So what do you get? Do you guys agree with me that, that that's, you know, kind of which hard that's... to disagree? Really? Okay. But go, but go ahead. All right. All go right. Well, no, I, I, I was just going to say like, when I think of this as like, so like the example that you gave as far as like the promises, um, well, let me read this real quick. Uh, this I'm excited is... to see what you have to say. I'm, like, I'm looking forward to this. this. Is... It's not really a hard disagree, but it's a little pushback. So, and, and I'm not really sure how, like, how this would fall, but, like, it, thinking about, like, God's promises, like, just for, like, a, a national Israel, I feel like Scripture is speaking against that. So, like, Galatians 3.16, it says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So like in, in reading that, like, I don't, it, it seems like you have to stretch in order to say that this is for like the entire nation of Israel, like for mm. example, in, in the example that you gave. So I'm not mm -hmm. really sure. I'm not entirely sure where that falls, but like when, when I look at what's um, espoused in, in certain views and then when I read certain things like this, I'm like, well, this, like what's being said flies in the face of scripture. So you would have to go with scripture. And I think that's one, um, strike against the belief in that particular view because scripture seems to be pointing to something different does mm -hmm. that make sense yeah but i don't know exactly where that falls into into what you were asking but right for me it's just like well i just look the minutiae is still kind of in the details yeah but i think with that i think you have and i and i would argue rightly so mm -hmm. that you do have a very analogy of faith as trumping every other hermeneutic mm -hmm. and then also with that again to your credit and again i agree mm -hmm. you know as much as possible having a christocentric view of all this and seeing christ really as the fulfillment of all of these promises right. Right. even though reading through the old testament some of them might like you know you would read that and you think oh well this isn't about just one dude you know right. this isn't just about the son but then again when mm -hmm. we when we look to the new testament it right. seems quite clear that christ is the fulfillment of all that right, yeah. right. My, my my pushback would just be that so with any view people are going to disagree over how it's defined so like you'll have people that will that will say that they're both practicing the grammatical historical method and uh and they will be practicing it slightly differently, and they will both claim kind of that ownership of the title. I, I would just say this, when it comes to things like, like for example, what you brought up with dispensationalism and the way they view Israel and the church and et cetera, that, that's not a grammatical historical method problem. Because the gra grammatical or issue, the grammatical historical method is that you have you pay attention to the grammar, grammatical, so you're, you're paying attention to the way the words are used within Scripture, and then historical, you're placing them within their historical context. So when, when Paul... Um, you know, talks about, oh goodness, when he talks about the, the household of God, the words he's using, using have a very specific time and place referent that mm -hmm. they are then, that they are then interpreted from. 
you can hold that without necessarily going toward dispensational thought. Mm -hmm. um, dispensationalism, the, the the pushback from their hermeneutic is more along issues of like typology. Yes. Um, can something be a type or a shadow in the Old Testament oh, without yeah, it being yeah. specified that it's a type or a shadow? Um, they they uh, they would p have issues w uh, with us with things like um, progressive revelation to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, that if God says uh, Israel's my people in the Old Covenant, and then in the New Covenant He says, um, you know, my people are those who follow my Son, that that progressive revelation can't reinterpret the older. Yeah, uh, the older revelation. So mm -hmm. what comes what comes after? It's not like they're cutting off the New Testament. I'm not saying that. I don't want to be unfair, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that they would not say that something can mean something then and then later, centuries later, it can mean far more and be reinterpreted by that latter revelation. Mm -hmm. Again, not that they don't say things can't point forward. I don't want to paint the wrong brushstrokes, but I'm saying that like the issues that I think between dispensational and and more covenant leaning hermeneutics is going to be about issues like typology and symbolism more mm -hmm. than it is um, the grammatical historical method itself. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So one right. can yeah. be grammatical, <laughs> historical, and disp dispensational or not. I don't yes. think there's going to be yes. a rub. Oh, no, no. There are rubs that. for yeah. their interpretive method because dispensationalism does interpret the Bible very differently than we do. Mm -hmm. um, and I say we as in us three guys sitting at this table. But uh, but I don't I don't think those are necessarily the grammatical historical methods problem. I see. Yeah, yeah, and I guess to to maybe backpedal a little bit, a little bit, not necessarily dispensational premillennial, but still premillennialism mm -hmm. of some kind. Like looking at uh, even like uh, Craig Blomberg's view, who's okay. historic pre mill or like Douglas Moo or somebody like that. Like those are going to be grammatical historical guys um, who are still going to be at least to some degree covenantal. But the main hinge point that they're going to have for holding to premillennialism is going to be based on their hermeneutic, I think, of the Old Testament more than anything else. Mm. Kind of. <laughs> kind of because because you've got uh, and, and and you mentioned blomberg which he's an interesting an interesting example in this regard so you have not just dispensational premillennialism or uh uh historic premillennialism but you also have progressive dispensationalism yes. along with more classical dispensationalism right so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of different strands of thought that play into that mm. um with somebody with somebody like a uh, so we started with three different camps now you have at least like three <laughs> versions of each each of these camps that's what happens in eschatology, what happens we, all, in eschatology we all subdivide man. to uh -huh. the nth degree yep um <laughs> No, it just it makes it a little harder to it makes it a little harder to say that you would tend toward that that direction because I think I think that you could have a hermeneutic or a way of reading the Bible which pays much attention to the words that were used in the Old Testament and that you take things very literally without imposing a wooden literal literalism yeah. on them which robs them of their meaning. Mm -hmm. So so in other words, if something can be a type and shadow in the Old Testament pointing toward a greater fulfillment in the New, we don't try to just hammer it into a wooden mold by saying it can have no further referent other than itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which again i'm not trying to i'm not trying to just besmirch that view yeah i'm just trying to be kind of specific with what i'm the the the, the friction where the friction is yeah mm -hmm. exactly and i think a lot of that is again gonna our criticism is going to be more of that it is assuming a very wooden literalism uh, in a lot of that stuff. And it's going to say, well, this wasn't exactly fulfilled the way that I think it should have been. Therefore, this must be a future thing that hasn't come to pass yet. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. though there are passages in the New Testament that would seem to indicate that Christ fulfilled this. Uh, right. For example, at Pentecost. Uh, you know, right. that fulfilled, what was it Amos? Joel. I think Joel, Joel that was right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It was all fulfilled. You know, you mm -hmm. read that and it's talking about, you know, blood moons and, right. you know, it right. just all these like yeah. apocalyptic language. And then we read the New Testament and we're like, oh, that happened at Pentecost. That's right. actually what that was talking about. That yeah. wasn't talking about some weird, like, John Hagee, <laughs> sweaty, whatever. Nobody, yeah, nobody no. knows who he is anymore. No. <laughs> aging out. <laughs> aging out of relevance on that one. Um, okay, so so this is a lot of a lot of difficulty, uh, or just confusion, potential confusion, I guess, which is different terms, things like that. How, Episode title. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but what are some keys for how do we recognize good eschatology? Or what are some things to look for uh, when you're looking for good eschatology? Yeah. That's maybe a more practical thing than just defining terms. Go ahead, Josh. Go ahead, Josh. <laughs> yeah. The better the eschatology, yeah. <laughs> um, the better the eschatology, the bigger the wall graph is my is my take on it. Mm -hmm. The more complicated the arrows are on that wall graph that you have taped to the side of the church wall, 
I'm just kidding. No, eschatology. It's es not a bad method, though. It, <laughs> hard to disagree. Anyway, <laughs> um, no, I mean, wait, a good eschatology is going to point to Christ and give believers hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if it doesn't, it's trash. I mean, that's that. That's just the general mm -hmm. take on eschatology, and that's not that's not me saying I think we should feel good. That's just me saying that when um, when the the when the eschatological message, if you just look at the revelation to John yeah. and just say, why was this given? It was given co uh, comfort and hope to yeah. a church in persecution. It right. says it. So if we're reading it in a way that does not give comfort and hope, we're doing it wrong. I don't yes. care what your view right. is yep. um, or how you read the Bible. So yep. that'd be one thing. So that, that so let me ask this, because um, I think maybe a lot of people who are listening to this, uh, maybe they've had this, this experience. Is this something to break fellowship over eschatology well Just... which 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 kind of eschatology if you have mm -hmm. number one an unorthodox or a heterodox mm -hmm. um full preterism yeah right. or something so you, like that so you right. come in and say christ has already returned i'm going to say well number one by our doctrinal statement you wouldn't be able to right to, to be here but also i would just say like within christian orthodoxy you know you're outside for yeah, sure the faith on that one Yep. Um, now, past that, though, yep. um, eschatology, if somebody's eschatology is leading them to a constant state of worry and defeat, um, that's not breaking fellowship, I wouldn't think, but that sure. would be a pastoral intervention type yes, thing. Of course. Be of course. Um, if, some, thing if, sure. if somebody is constantly, you know, forming ulcers because they're curled up in a ball weeping in the corner and have been for the last, you know, three years or however long um, because of their eschatology, well, that would be an eschatological problem that I, that you'd have to address. What right? about an uh, someone who holds the amillennial view calling someone who's pre mill a heretic? Because well, I mean, it view. depends. Okay. Is he a heretic? <laughs> Just because one is pre mill or op mill doesn't make one not a heretic, so right? So, what if they hold the view that how I would say, like the the pre the the person who's the dispensationalist? Um, I would say essentially they believe that Jesus is he's going to come a total of three times, even though they would say that it's two times or it's two times, but uh, like, what, what if they believe something like that? Okay. Like what's the third? So you would have, so the dispensationalists would see Jesus coming and there being a rapture future event yep. that kicks off the thousand year reign of Christ. Christ comes back at the end. Right. It was like the final, it was the final battle. So he would come two more times. Unless, so yeah, and then like battle unless, again unless and stuff. Christ comes at the rapture, comes at the instant instantiation of the kingdom and then comes again at the end of the kingdom to judge the living and the dead which oh, would be see, three that, that's three okay see i wasn't there's that's one sort of those three. i wasn't even i think, <laughs> wasn't yeah. even aware of <laughs> I, I, I guess my view like i think that's wrong but i don't think sure. that's an issue of heresy or breaking fellowship like i think that's kind of going beyond what the bible says right i would say that would be a good maybe probing question for their viewpoint like are you are you saying that it's two or possibly three returns can you walk me through that and then that may give you an opportunity to walk through something that you believe not to be biblically true. But yeah, I, as see, far as heresy, uh, well, I don't see think what, so. what you're doing, what you were just doing right there, you're you're giving the tools on how to ask those questions without getting all fired up and then accusing the person of being a heretic, right. and then mm -hmm. thus you're no longer you know in fellowship with one another yep, anymore. Right. Yep. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that happens a lot with these type of conversations. I, I like there was a time that I would have said uh, that I was a pan millennialist. I think someone is gonna. <laughs> maybe go into that and the old it, it's, pen mill. it's a it's a it's a dismissal which by the way just to define it yeah okay. sure yeah it's that it'll all pan out in the end yeah, right that's my right. that's where everybody groans and then i kick a trash can over. <laughs> go ahead for uh -huh. well when someone says that it's it's somewhat of a dismissal even if it's not intentional um as if to say that you know discussing isn't isn't important mm -hmm, i right. think it has importance mm -hmm. um it's just not something to break fellowship over yes. and i don't think a lot of people maybe because of the way they've been taught they don't know how to engage with others who hold a different view right. who might have been taught up in that view so what you were just doing as far as like asking those probing questions without you know pounding your fists on the table and basically saying you're a heretic right you know and mm -hmm. never talking to them again i think those are good tools for people to have when engaging with this type of stuff yeah um and and the thing with eschatology like number one i agree with you but but w when people you know if somebody asks me like hey what's your eschatology or hey what do you think about the end times or you know some th something specific what do you think mm -hmm. about the market where the are beast? we in the book of revelation where are we, where are we? um usually like i start to kind of get my settled in you know like well if you'll hang on for a second I've got some 
And then I know that, like, that's not what people want. They we want make the... some coffee. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Throw on a pot here. A pot we're gonna, we're, it's going to be a minute. <laughs> but people want the quick reaction. Like, what are you? I'm pretty mill. Well, I'm a mill. Right. <laughs> um, but you don't know what they actually believe half the time. Right. And I, I think that should be kind of clear just from us kind of wading through some of those those different perspectives in our heads earlier. Mm. Um, most people aren't even really that thought through on their eschatology. They right. have not. They have not thought every different category through and how it all works out. So really they're kind of somewhere in the middle and then gray or kind of hazy at that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the best questions you can ask are like, Hey, what, what's, what's your conviction about the end times? Like, do you think we're in the end times now? Like, what do you think about Christ returning? What do you think about um, the kingdom that Christ is establishing? Just, mm-hmm. just clarifying questions. And then you can have that, that honest dialogue for sure. But Definitely. most Christians don't want that. That's true. Unfortunately. Um, and that's, and that's tragic. Because yep. that, that just means we're aiming for a fight, and yeah. it's not becoming of a Christian. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Sorry, hopefully yep. I didn't derail us. No. Asking that. No, okay. no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Because, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, I, I guess, kind of the next thing that I want to talk about is just, you know, why is it important or relevant, and is it fine if we just say, hey, uh, people have been debating this for thousands of years, we can't really know, it'll all pan out in the end, I'm a pan mill. They right. say you know, why Why Calvinism. does it matter? You, you know, why Why does it matter? Yeah. They say that about the Calvinist-Arminian yeah. debate. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. Nearly every every just years. about everything. Right. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, it's everything. like there's just there's the pendulum swing. Yeah. There's some people who are, you know, doctrinally, doctrinally zealous who want to fight about everything, and mm-hmm. then other people... Who, or just okay, tell me what to believe, and right. you know that's fine. And and then other people are like, well, I I don't really care. <laughs> right, right. But were you feeling that one for now? I'm sorry. Why does it matter? Oh yeah. Why? Does oh, it matter? or does it matter? Or does it matter? No, I I mean I think it matters. I like for for one, um, you know we we want to know. It goes back to hope, right? Yeah. I mean, like all of this is not for nothing. Like like Jesus is coming back. You know there there's um. There's just hope in all of this. I mean, I mean, it just isn't necessarily happening in the United States um, right now. Uh, but, you know, Christians across the globe are being persecuted in a way that we've never seen mm-hmm. before, you know, well, at least in our time, you know. Um, so knowing that there will be judgment and, you know, that Jesus is coming for his people, mm-hmm. you know, I think that brings hope. And so studying eschatology and wanting to know, you know, as best as we can, like, OK, how is this going to work out? You know, I mean, I think that's one way how it matters. Basically, going back to hope, mm-hmm. yeah. Basically, but yeah. Um. So the the consistent way we read scripture for everything else, like let's just exclude eschatology. Mm-hmm. But the way we read scripture for everything else is that we assume that God communicated it, that He communicated it effectively, and mm-hmm. that it has immediate and prescient bearing on our daily lives. Mm-hmm. Like this is this is how we ought to think and live and and move and have our being. Um. But then when we get to the eschatological passages it's like you're reading along and daniel happy as you know happy as a, a june bug and then all of a sudden you get to this one passage you're like oh nope here comes that that weird statue and then <laughs> that after statue, that there's some yeah. night visions and it's all very <laughs> odd um as if god just kind of threw that in there willy-nilly or, or didn't do a good job communicating it yeah now, we would never say that but um but it's but it's 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 odd that for christians we get to some of the parts in scripture for example the revelation um, I understand it's difficult. There's dragons running around. Um, there's a lot of things going on that we're not familiar with. You have to read a lot of the Old Testament to understand the imagery yeah. even. So it's hard. Mm-hmm. But you, you read the Revelation and Christ says, number one, it's an unveiling, which doesn't mean it's something hidden in a bushel tucked under a you know knapsack. This is something that God's saying, I'm unveiling this to you. Mm-hmm. Not hiding it or confusing it, but mm-hmm. I'm unveiling this to you. And he says, I'm doing it for your hope in the tribulation. Mm-hmm. That That's important for the Christian. So that the fact that we would come to that and say, man, though, that's going to take me reading some Ezekiel passages and I might actually have to study. I'm not doing that. Um, it's to take something that God has said. We wouldn't do that anywhere else in the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so it's taking something God has said and he says, I've given this to you unveiled for your hope. And then we treat it as if, like, no, God really meant it as a big jigsaw puzzle that we can never figure out. Right. Well, no, he didn't. He told you why. And that's not how you study your Bible. Right. So... Yeah, for for me, I've always I've always felt that Christians um, need to study eschatology more. And and I know in your head you're probably thinking, well, a lot of Christians do have eschatological opinions. They usually haven't studied it much though. That's, that's very and true. And I say that not pointing fingers. I'm just saying that, like, honestly, if you were to some of the most vocal proponents of their their views that I've talked to, just a couple of questions, they're like, well, I don't know where it is, and they're like, I've never really studied this that much. And I was like, say, it's one thing to have an opinion; it's another thing to be like, okay, well, show me in the Bible best. why, where, exactly. where does this view come from? Exactly. Right? And you know, coming up with like the rapture stuff oh, and yeah. the seven year tribulation and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like, okay. 
Well, a lot, show me that in the Bible. <laughs> a lot of Christians uh, our age, um, I, I think that they their es- eschatological views come from the Left Behind series. Yeah. I mean, yep. I, I read those. As a yeah, kid. yeah, seriously. Um, and it, it's it's no different than, you know, uh, listening to your pastor and then they are um, exegeting, hopefully, <laughs> um, a scripture <laughs> and you take on what they say as part of your belief, but you right. haven't actually studied it or looked at it for yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think it's the same way with eschatology. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times. And it shouldn't be that way. That's why we're having this episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Learn learn from others, but when you're when you're pressed on any given belief, not that we're just biblicists to the point of like not wanting other Christians to speak into our lives. Like we're not saying right. that. We're not just saying it's you, your Bible and your prayer closet. Right. But um, if you're trusting what a pastor said, I, I, you you better know what he is pointing to in scripture right. and have read it yourself. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I've I've benefited greatly from from men of men and women of God who have um, taught certain things or pointed out yep. certain truths, and then I see them confirmed in scripture. And that's been immensely helpful. Yep. But that doesn't mean I'm neglecting actually seeing that these things. Right. It's are not so, a one or the right. other. Right. Yeah. It's not yeah. one or the other. Scripture is the authority, but uh, it but, falls into what Dave said. You know, just tell me what to believe. <laughs> Yeah, and right. I believe it. You know, it's yep. easier that way. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um. So okay. So we we've talked about, or at least to some degree, obviously mm-hmm. not fully, but just some of the different um sort of themes or elements of eschatology. So you talk about the timing and the substance of the millennium a little bit. Um. We've at least mentioned the rapture. We have okay the resurrection, yep. resurrection of the dead. Um. Haven't really talked much about the antichrist or the mark of the beast. But one of the other sure. one of the other big ones is um is dealing with the defeat and specifically the binding of Satan. So that's something that's kind of intertwined with the millennium. Right. Um. So if you're not familiar in uh, Revelation chapter twenty, it speaks of Satan being bound for a thousand years during this reign. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I th- someone that I know recently wrote a book on that topic. Yeah. yeah. I've heard um, of that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Josh, do you want to, uh, ma- yeah, maybe just, uh, just break down a little bit. Um, you have basically an entire book on this one aspect, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> just over thanks for the shameless over. plug yeah. <laughs> or, on my behalf. No. Um, yeah. So I, re- I wrote on that. And one of the really interesting things, um, writing on that was when we were at the, uh, the, the elders here at grace, we went to the, the little conference on eschatology down in, uh, Northern Il- Indiana, almost at Illinois, uh, Northern Indiana that's next month. Yeah, that's next month. <laughs> yeah. And um, anyway, one, one of the one of the sticking points I think everybody realized was is Satan defeated right now or bound right now or, or and what does that mean? That that was kind of like a huge and that had always been my contention. That seems like a huge domino to fall in how you see eschatology. Um, Where is this Satan that Christ says he's defeated? Um, just to sum up my book really quickly, um, my, my whole my whole point in the book is that uh, Christ talked about Satan being bound long before Revelation 20. That's right. essentially my argument. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Christ talks about it when he when he says that I saw Satan fall from, like lightning from heaven, Luke 10. Um, when he talks about the ruler of this world Say being it's all through bound and yeah. cast out, John 12, 14, 16. When he says that he bound the strong man, that he could plunder his house. Same exact Greek word used in Revelation for the binding of Satan. I mm-hmm. think I think he was telling us for a while about his binding of Satan, and I think the New Testament susses that out. Paul talks about um, him having defeated rulers and authorities in Colossians 2 and Hebrews 2. So anyway, in a nutshell, that's just my contention is that, yes, Satan is bound, and Christ has told us since, since his ministry and has explained that at several junctures, um, our question then should be like biblically, what does that look like? That's right. a good question. Yeah. Um, but to affirm he's bound or not bound, just based on on you know looking around and like, well, I've got a backache this week. He's not bound. <laughs> that's not that's not doing biblical justice. To something sure. Christ has stated he has done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's funny. I've had a lot of conversations with different people around eschatology, and uh, it seems like that is one. I, I'm really thankful that you wrote that book because honestly, that is one of the most common objections that I hear um, to either the ah mill or the post mill view, really anything right. that looks at Satan bound, they'll say, well, look at the state the world's in right now. Yeah, right. Like really with rampant, you know, transgenderism and yeah. wars and famines and, you know, and all this, are you really telling me that Satan is bound right mm-hmm. now? Um, and I think, again, kind of going back to the question that we asked earlier is how do you recognize good eschatology? And maybe another question is how do you recognize bad eschatology? And one of those would be, trying to look around at the world around you now and then trying to sort well, of fit what you see with that as and, opposed to and there 
man, we're gonna get off on a tangent. <laughs> no, this this irks me because um, there there have been popular pastors that that seat thousands in their congregation that have booming radio and television ministries mm-hmm. who have held the Bible up and said, "You interpret this through your newspaper. Mm-hmm. You want to know what's going on in Revelation? You look to the to the New New York Times." Mm-hmm. That's that is a garbage way of approaching scripture, mm-hmm. um, and it has led a lot of people into despair and confusion when it comes to the end times. Yeah, they see a whole lot of things going on, but they don't see Christ. Right, and and that that's that's one approach that very much irks me. Um, if you can't tell, I'm sorry, yeah. weighing my words. <laughs> yeah, but, back to sort of the binding of Satan. So that's obviously that's going to be one of the really common ones. Is just right. look around. Satan's obviously not bound. People are more deceived and enslaved to sin than ever. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be one objection. But Can again, I put in one plug. Yes. Spoiler alert. It's in the last chapter of my book too. But um, if if you if you're wondering like what would it look like if Satan is not bound, just go forward to that passage. Mm-hmm. Read Revelation 27 through 10 and mm-hmm. see what happens. Every nation on the earth rises up in rebellion against God and are smushed in an instant. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. that's what it looks like for right. them to be unbound. I would say so. Or I would say on a similar note, look at the nations in the Old Testament outside right. of Israel. Right. You know, you have I mean deplorable things happening inside oh, Israel right. throughout the Old Testament, yeah. but it's like literally Satan just had dominion yeah. over right. you know basically all the nations oh, of the yeah. world. You know, when rampant, you know, like just demon yeah, worship and just point. just yeah. all this rampant stuff, and it was like dominion okay. by God's permission. Of course. Yes, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. yep. And we could. Uh, <laughs> No, I don't. I don't crack. <laughs> I, I, um, I didn't want anybody on there to kay. picture that Jesus arm wrestling oh, right. picture. I just wanted to avoid that. I knew <laughs> that what you meant. But. Um, I was going to say I, th- probably the the second most common objection that I hear to that is uh, the passage in Peter where it talks about su- Satan roaring around like a lion mm-hmm. seeking whom he may devour, yeah. and they would say again. Satan's obvious. Is he bound or is he, see, you know, roaming around right. seeking whom he may devour? Right. Um, mm-hmm. And they would say, well, that's, you know, direct proof that Satan's not bound now. Yeah. Oh, was that to me? Yeah, that's oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, and, and to look at that one again, you would have to, uh, when when you're interpreting any passage, Satan is a spiritual being, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we know that he's not inhabiting a, a body as, as humans are. This is talking about a spiritual adversary. Um, and if scripture describes him ro- uh, prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, um, every bit of that, obviously we would know that doesn't, that doesn't mean that Satan's a literal lion. He's not literally walking around on the earth. So we automatically, everyone automatically recognizes it's talking about spiritual realities that are bigger than this picture of him as a roaring lion. Mm-hmm. What does that look like? Um, and when you read scripture, there's a consistent refrain of there being a satanic influence in this world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, John can talk about antichrist, spirit of antichrist and antichrists running around in first John in the same way we can see satanic power in essence or satanic influence or however you want to say it. You can see Satan through some of the evil men in this world. Um, you can mm-hmm. see mass murderers and see, see essentially Satan personified through them, working through them, in, in a sense glorified through them. Mm-hmm. Um, evil evil world rulers who have killed tens of millions of their own citizens, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. So is Satan at work in this world? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That has no bearing on whether he's restrained. Right. And mm-hmm. specifically restrained from, as Revelation 20 specifies, from deceiving the nations. Right. Mm-hmm. So, And that's the key. I loved, uh, on my other uh, podcast worldview warriors we did a series of stuff on uh on eschatology and we brought in some different scholars and stuff and that was a question that i love that uh doug wilson asked was you know okay well he's bound but with respect to what mm-hmm. right because the text mm-hmm. tells us right. you know because that's i think a lot of the problem is people will read that oh, okay satan's bound and then they just kind of make up in their head what do i think it would look like if satan sure. was bound yeah uh and, and and then the world doesn't match my conception of yeah. what i think binding should look like yeah and rather is... than reading the bible and saying oh with respect to this particular exactly way. exactly and this is this is exactly what what i was trying to say earlier with the grammatical historical method is that 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 is honoring that sort of method of reading scripture mm-hmm. because it's not just saying i mean i heard, I heard a guy one time a, a, a scholar he was a professor and he was going on at great length i think it was in an actual journal article about how satan satan is bound and then he would go on at great length scripture clearly says that satan is completely bound from all activity and everything has ceased and his spiritual influence is gone and it's and it's like but it doesn't say that right like you're saying it means that but if you just read the text what does the text actually say oh the text says he's bound that he may not deceive the nations Mm -hmm. it defines that word Mm -hmm. um what 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 happens a lot in eschatology though is again those very and by people who should know better like 
scholars, pastors, those who study scripture um, quite frequently, um, very strong held opinions. And yet I think a good question, and I would encourage this question for me as well. Like people, if, the, if you hear me say something, just, can you show me where that is? Sure. Mm-hmm. Like, show me, show me how you're getting there. Yep. Um, and if we can, that's great. If, mm-hmm. if you say, well, that's what I think it means. You know, that's what it feels like to me. It means, well, mm-hmm. we got a problem there. Mm-hmm. That's just, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think, uh, kind of going back to as well, like looking at the picture of, okay, so what did the, the world look like prior to Christ coming in terms of being just enslaved by Satan, essentially. Mm -hmm. And and this kind of also harkens back to what Josh said about really eschatology isn't just a, here's the things down at the very end. It's looking at the scope of redemptive history, Mm -hmm. you know, essentially looking at like, I love the, I think it was one of the Puritans. I don't remember which one, but described, you know, sort of the picture of the gospels, like seeing a sunrise where it's like, you know, first you just see, you know, this little gleam of of Mm -hmm. sunlight and, you know, and it's just, it's rising up as, as, more revelation comes throughout scripture we see this but we see the same thing too with just the fulfillment of the gospel Mm -hmm. and with the gospel going to the nations right um and so there's i think a direct correspondence there and i'll kind of lob this back over to you but there's a direct correspondence there with you know the the work in the earthly ministry of christ and then you have the gospel then going out to those nations Mm -hmm. and i think there's there's a direct correlation with you know satan being bound while you know as it says in mark you know Satan's the strong man who's bound so that Christ can plunder his house. Right. That is the gospel going out to the nations. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think, I think the, one of my favorite parts in, in studying that was, was that picture you get in Luke 10. Um, you have in Luke 10, you have Christ commissioning the disciples. He sends them out two by two. It's the, you know, that famous chapter where he talks about if you go into a town and they, they reject you and they turn you from their house, you knock the dust off your, you know, off yourself and continue about, continue on. Well, he sends the disciples out. There's some interlude and the disciples come back and they're proclaiming and and celebrating. And they said, you know, we're, we're casting out demons and we're proclaiming the good news. And we're essentially fulfilling that, that disciple making task that Christ has commissioned his people to. Um, And that's when Christ frames that in the context of his defeat of Satan. Mm -hmm. And he says, he says, yeah, I've seen Satan fall like lightning from heaven, Mm -hmm. a, a, a strike down of Satan. Um, it's something, again, he'd talked about it several times before with his disciples. I don't think they were lost. Um, they had heard such things from his mouth before that he is even now casting out Satan from this world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's just one of the stories that I really loved because it shows that fruit of the gospel. What does it look like when Christ restrains that strong man that he can plunder his house? Um, it looks like the gospel going out to all nations. Mm-hmm. It looks like the completion of what Christ has commissioned his people to do. Right. Um, but one pushback I would always push back with, and it's not just on satanic satanic uh defeat but since we're in that and since i since since i did write on it um is one of the things that i've always been dissatisfied with is the the brushing aside of what does it mean Mm -hmm. so if christ in um in all the gospels has said i have bound the or excuse me all three synoptics has said i have bound the strong man to plunder his house and you ask okay so he goes on about that for about you know several verses depending on which which book what does that mean? And the mm-hmm. response is, I don't know. Well, that, that, that's, that's insufficient. Mm-hmm. I would say at least, you know, you don't have to go along with my, my every specific eschatological belief. But for anything, when Christ says, I've done this thing, our response can't be, well, I don't know what that really means. Mm-hmm. What does he say it means? Because mm-hmm. to do that is to honor the words of Christ. Which right. We know all scripture is the words of Christ, but you understand what I'm oh, saying. Yeah. It's to honor when Christ says, this is what I've done. We can say yes and amen. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and let his words carry the weight that they were meant to. There's something I wanted to ask, um, and it, I, I thought it'd be a fun question, um, and because we haven't mentioned Nephilim, at least we haven't mentioned oh, it one time Oh, yeah, it's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> we so, are already at the 50-minute mark, and you're uh, bringing up Nephilim? No, no, I'd say we haven't mentioned Nephilim, but I, I think this would I, fall I'll into the category. I'll have you had a conversation about Nephilim this morning. Really? Did you? Yeah. All right. It's been a good week. Yeah. Built in on that. We'll yeah. Stop the yeah, recording, yeah. So years ago, uh, I was probably like 18 or 19, a friend of mine told me, that, um, you know, uh, scripture talks of things that are worse than Satan. And I was like, things that are worse than Satan? What are you talking about? And he took me to Revelation 9. I'm just going to read this. You might already know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star uh, fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened, and the smoke uh, darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth. Uh, they were they were 
told not to harm the grass. Oh, hold on. I'm, I'm getting mixed up here. Sorry. Then the smoke. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or anything green uh, or any any tree, but only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Mm-hmm. And they were allowed to torment them for five months, but not kill them. Yeah. Those are Black Hawk helicopters. <laughs> I wondered if someone was going to bring that up. It's in a, it's in a book. It's in a book. <laughs> I mean, not not the book, but it's, in, right, a it's book. in a book. Right, right. Who was it that claimed that Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist? I think a oh, lot someone, of people. I don't remember. Well, maybe I read during a really that time, they probably just, did. Yeah. I read an interesting list one time. I think they just went through, like, from the reformers on, all the people that had been identified as the Antichrist. Uh-huh. It was, it was, substantial. Yeah. But so, so my friend at the time, he was saying that these things that came you know came out were worse than satan um my question is like wh- what do you think those things are and i i don't one one uh theory is that they are black hawk helicopters but i know none of us think that but just what what are your thoughts on that if if you have any what the what the locusts are yeah being released from the pit yeah the way it's described and what they can do and, and yeah. so on and so forth so well, unless you had something to say ah uh... Sure. Yeah. So, so I think in a, in a lot of it, again, we talk about interpretation being key. So sure. how, how do we understand the book of revelation mm-hmm. is one of those things. Cause if, and again, I guess I, I would probably agree with what you're about to push back on me that reading revelation, <laughs> reading revelation, if we're going to do literal grammatical historic interpretation, correct. Yeah. We're going to look at revelation as what it is, which is apocalyptic symbolism. Sure. And sure understanding that john is seeing pictures essentially yeah so what he's yeah. writing down is just visions that god is giving him mm-hmm. so we're not understanding uses that word exactly, yeah. exactly. exactly. literally yeah. it's in there yes. so if we're going to be true to that we're going to understand it in that way and not understand it as something that is like woodenly literal or same thing with when there's dragons and beasts and things sure. like that so so i would just think of okay so what symbolically speaking what what what's associated with locusts mm. right locusts come and they destroy the food supply yeah yep. um, that's not saying that there's going to be a literal famine mm. but it's something regarding just bad nourishments going what do scorpions represent you know it could be you know various evil spirits or pestilences or okay. or different things like this so I, I guess my uh just sort of default understanding of a lot of these things is it's not probably describing something strictly literal but just referring to general pains and difficulties and and things like that symbolically hard disagree oh no i'm just kidding i'm just kidding three in one episode i'm just kidding no um you you said what chapter are you in again Uh, nine nine Nine. yeah Yeah. so yeah when you look at 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 the revelation there there's several uh we would call them recapitulations but essentially like dave was talking about several retellings of that same story and what I've, what I've always encouraged people to do is just read read the Revelation and see if it seems like it's repeating itself. See mm-hmm. if the same characters seem to be popping back up, but just told in a different light. Um, same story, just told kind of with different scenery or different different uh, symbolism would be what we're aiming at. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, you, you, you get a couple of recapitulations in the, the opening chapters. I would say one through three really seem like one unit. They're very this worldly, which is how Revelation starts. It's talking about actual churches on the actual earth and he's giving them um, instruction. But even then you start to get symbolism. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's writing to the angels mm-hmm, of those right. churches. Mm-hmm. And, and you start to get things that are seeping in a little bit. They talk about Satan's throne and, and where Satan lies and stuff. And you're like, okay, so there's a little bit of that weaving in. Well, the further you go, the more the symbolism comes through until sure. until it's almost like you've left that physical world and you're in the painting. Right. So like you start sitting on the bench in the world, I'm on the bench, I'm on the floor, but I'm looking at the painting. Mm -hmm. And then the further you move through it, you're in the painting at the end where the world's still there, but only a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's talking about those, those spiritual realities that are being accomplished. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, back to the locusts, you see that in the old Testament um, with plagues that God denounced against his people. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think, I think, uh, um, no good grief, not Joel, but uh, no, it was Joel. Yeah. So Joel has one of those, those really poignant, uh messages about locusts yeah. coming in and it's always a destructive judgment rendered upon god's people it's something that sin brings mm-hmm. and it's a destructive and it wipes them out and it threatens their livelihood and their crops and everything else so when you read that in the revelation locusts wouldn't have been a new thing to the hebrews mm-hmm. right they, they understood what lo- locusts meant and if you think people don't kind of carry those memories in their head nobody treated the nile the same way after god 
um, put the plagues on Egypt. Mm-hmm. And no, nobody treated walking through the water the same way after God parted the sea for them. Like symbolism was carried throughout their their uh, their normal lives. And I would say we do the same thing, just in a, in a different way. Um, but anyway, that long round answer. That's pointing you to God's judgment being rendered on sinful humanity. Okay. Um, and I think it's told several different ways throughout those recapitulations in Revelation. That's not the only place we, we read about it, but when we read about it there, it's pictured as locusts, a mm-hmm. plague coming through. Um, if, if that sounds weird to you, just consider the different ways that several prophets talked about the Babylonian exile. Mm-hmm. Um, so Israel, one punctiliar event in history... One single, singular event in history. (laughs) That's a good word, punctiliar. That's a great word, yeah. But one single event in history, um, what literally happened was a bunch of Babylonians came, grabbed the Hebrews, burned everything, and took back off to Babylon, Uh in essence. Uh Uh-huh. Um, however, you've got several different prophets writing at the same time using vivid imagery to describe what's happening to God's Mm -hmm. people. Um, does that make it more confusing? No, it makes it richer. Sure. Yeah. Um, when you've yeah. got these, these prophets giving you different insight into what's being accomplished, that makes it a better story. Yeah. yeah. And to be honest, it's almost kind of similar to how Jesus would describe the kingdom of God with all these different pictures. Right. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. all the, the yeah. kingdom of heaven yeah. is like this, yeah. you know, it's yeah. like this, you know, it's like a, a, you know, someone who finds a treasure in a field and sells everything he owns to do that. Right. Oh, it's also like a woman who loses her coin. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. like there's, there's a lot of different ways you can describe it. And those aren't, contrasting things yeah. sometimes they'll show different elements right. um, but ultimately it's just it's a different picture that's pointing to the same truth right and it's a real truth i, I always try to, to to reiterate this when people are thinking about symbolism but the symbol doesn't make the thing that it's pointing to less real it makes it more real yeah mm-hmm. so when jesus says hey the kingdom's like a mustard seed the kingdom is something much more real and much more grand than a mustard seed mm-hmm. what the thing that is being used to point to it is less the thing being pointed to is far greater. So if you're if you're hearing this and you're thinking, well, man, that just means revelation. It's just not talking about anything real. No, it's talking about things that are far more real. Yes. Mm-hmm. So when you have a dragon rising out of the sea looking to consume the offspring of the woman, something that that's pointing to is far more real than the actual dragon or an actual woman. It's something far grander and sure. more tangible. Do you think? Um, I think we're losing cameras. By the way, we've yeah, gone we're... on we've gone on a bit long on this one. So let's think toward the end. That was a pun. I'll save that another time. Never mind. I was going to say, yeah. Pun, at least. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure this is one of uh, one of many, you know, episodes that we're going to end up doing on eschatological themes one again. Part due next week. Maybe. Yeah. We'll Maybe. See. We'll see what the week holds <laughs> for us. That'd be fun. Yeah. But yeah, because I mean, it, like like we said, like I had. Not that I ever expected to get through them, but just a, a bunch of different bullets, you know, because again, like the things That's that are really exciting to talk about are, you know, okay, well, who is the Antichrist and what's that yeah. going to be like and what's the mark, of the, the mark of the beast and, yeah. and things like that. And I, I guess maybe I'll. All right. So you, you in the in the passage that you read, it talks about how those who are sealed with what was it? The mark uh, of the lamb. Uh, uh, sealed with God on their forehead. Sealed with God on their forehead. Oh, so, yeah, so that's that's just another thing where people are looking for this. We'll talk more about the market. Oh, later, yeah. They, yeah. People think that it's, it's like monster Bitcoin or like a QR code or, you know, yeah. something like that. And it's like, no, it's just it's something that's contrasted with, you know, there's a group who are sealed with God and there's a group who are sealed with the devil, yeah. essentially. And that's just kind of the way of, of breaking that up. And I was actually just reading a Deuteronomy the other day where, you know, it's talking or maybe we read through that at church. Maybe, but it was just uh, in Deuteronomy where it was talking about just, you know, teaching your children in the law of God and having it, you know, written on your forehead, you know, yeah. written between your eyes and on your hand. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, exactly. It's Sunday. the same. Um, yeah, yeah, same same thing. So mm-hmm. we're not necessarily looking for these these hyper literal uh, things like this, but we're, we're looking to pick up uh, symbolism and looking to pick up themes that are throughout um, the scripture. And we, we want and the, to. It would have been things the symboli- that they could understand. Well, and the symbolism yeah. at the time too. the symbolism to point you toward how you ought live because because right. if, if the mark of the beast is like my monster can you guys know the one i'm talking about don't you with the monster can where yeah it's like you the hold it on yeah. the symbols yeah kind of right like it doesn't it's still i've, I've seen it, it a dozen times and i'm still <laughs> yeah. like yeah i see it kind of anyway <laughs> um that would be really easy for me to not drink monsters like oh that's the mark of yeah. the beast and that's 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 the danger of of uh having a having a uh, an untrained approach to reading scripture, just just a wild and untethered approach to reading scripture, where you mm-hmm. just make it whatever you want to make it. Because if all I have to do is avoid monster cans, that's really stinking easy. Mm-hmm. However, if the mark of the beast is actually something more real than the thing that's that it's pointing or that's pointing oh, to yeah. it, 
In other words, it's something far more than just a little smudge on my forehead. Yeah. It's actually talking about Satan having marked me with the actions yeah. of my life, bearing oh, yeah. witness to whose I am. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I've got a problem because that impacts the way I parent, and I am a husband, and I am a church member, and yeah. I live my life at work. Like Then, all of a sudden, it impacts you. A whole lot easier if it's just a monster can, and I can be like, oh, those millennials all go into hell. And there's a lot of monsters. Christians that don't like to talk about behavior. Yeah. Because a lot of this, right. it comes down to behavior, mm -hmm. you know, where you can see a person's fruit, right. you know. Um, You'll see what's inside the yeah, fruit. Yeah, definitely. Yep, absolutely. See, you jumped into the Mark of the Beast. Sorry. Let's wrap yeah, this yeah, one up. Yeah. We, we'll have to revisit. We'll have yeah. to revisit. We'll, we'll, we'll be back. Yeah. We'll be, we'll, we'll be back. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, questions. If you would like us to answer definitively and for once and for all, um, you know, anything about the Mark of the Beast or, um, you know, the, the seven seals Bitcoin or, or, or Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Or, or whatever. The way it's dropping um, right now, it's not much of a mark. But... Choose our <laughs> email at the age to come webcast at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you and uh, always thank you guys for your encouragement and uh, and yeah, for any questions that might come in. Absolutely. And uh, please uh, subscribe to our channel if you haven't. We're uh, getting close to being able to have our own URL that's not just a bunch of gobbledygook. Mash, so, uh, mash that You button. always say that. You need a new word. I, I'm, no, I'm an old one. man, Dave. I don't, I don't do new things. Did use decimate I, last time? I don't remember what I used. Obliterate. Obliterate. Yeah, obliterate the logic. like button. Um, but yeah, anyway, hope you guys have enjoyed this. Um, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks, probably with more eschatology. I would think um, so. I would yeah, think so. I'm, always, I'm always down for eschatology. Absolutely. So yes. Anyway, grace and peace. We love you guys, and uh, we'll see you Sunday.